Welcome into uh, Morning Invest on this December 28th. Hey, it's my mom's birthday. It is. December 28th. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, birthday mother-in-law. Mom. Happy birthday, mom. Uh, I think she might be watching the show today. If you are, say hello in the chat, mom. Happy birthday, mom. Uh, coming up on the show, we're going to talk about why politicians' approval ratings, uh, well, the new report out about politicians' approval ratings. And some of these people on this list got really high approval ratings, and we're scratching our head about it. So we'll go through that today on the show. Also, how has the pandemic and lockdowns affected children? We knew this wouldn't be good, but a new study out of the National Institute of Health confirms that it's not good. And is NASA getting ready for worldwide alien disclosure? I mean, it's about time. We all know that they've been working on this for many, many years and downed UFOs. But now they're hiring theologians to prepare all of us for what this world will be like once we realize that we are not alone. All of that and more as Morning Invest starts right now. All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome into Morning Invest. I'm Clayton Morris. I'm Natalie Morris. This is the only show that you need in the mornings because all of the mainstream media is a bunch of garbage. Wouldn't you say that? I would say that. And we're going to tell you how uh, we're not alone in feeling that way later up later in the show. Why people are ditching media. We'll yeah. get to that. We've got new COVID numbers out this morning, new data out of uh, South Africa on Omicron. We'll get to that, which is actually pretty encouraging. But states reporting this morning a record number across the United States, 512 cases on Monday. That is the most for a single day since the start of the pandemic. Yeah, that's pretty unbelievable. Meanwhile, the Centers for Disease Control, CDC, on Monday reduced the recommendation for isolation periods for people infected from COVID-19 to five days, down from 10 days. Now, get this, okay? This new guidance reflects growing evidence that people with the virus are only infectious for one or two days. It took us this long to figure this out before the onset of the symptoms and then two to three days afterwards. So then oh, we're having these people in lockdowns for 10 days? Or, or yeah, maybe they took this long to listen to us or actual data. I mean, two days, that's people it? people have known this for a long time. Yeah, I mean, well, think about when we were under lockdown. How long were we under lockdown once we had the kids? Uh, uh, forever. Yeah, it like, felt like forever. Like 27 days. Or <laughs> like my yeah. sister had, it was like a rolling, like her daughter then tested positive and then the one was negative. Then the one, and they were home for like a month. Yes. A, yeah. a month for these guidelines. Because there was one that refused to test positive. So <laughs> she continued to get her exposure date pushed out because she was exposed to her siblings that she lived but the siblings they were under an eight they were under eight days only of Jeez. lockdown it's yeah it's, it's torture it's crazy meanwhile dc maryland virginia all hit records yesterday florida is now back at a major hot spot and u.s hospitals are at capacity as president biden did something very strange yesterday during his meeting with governors it's got a lot of people wondering and shaking their heads like what is he talking about right if there's no he said basically he agreed with the uh, republican governors that each state should deal with this differently and that there's no federal response to covid here is the president speaking to reporters, I'm sorry, to these governors yesterday. Let's listen. Look, there is no federal solution. This gets solved at a state level. Seeing how tough it was for some folks to get a test this weekend shows that we have more work to do. When I took office 10 months into the, we were 10 months into the pandemic, and even so, we had no, zero, over-the-counter home tests in the United States. So we got to work. We quadrupled the number of pharmacies offering a free test. And there are now more than 20,000 places where you can get tested for free. For over-the-counter at-home tests, as I said, there, there, there were none when we took office. None. So, okay, so there's no federal response? I mean, did you hear that? He's admitting we have no federal response to COVID. This has to be handled at the state level. Meanwhile, hasn't the, the Biden well, administration been suing certain states over there yeah. the way they've handled COVID? Yes. Yeah, look at Florida. Crazy. Like Florida's <laughs> been one of the ones that has actually done something to reduce numbers and they, and they get crapped on all the time. I mean, I'm just throwing up my hands at this point because I, I just can't wrap my head around it. So but it seems like because on the campaign trail, he was so adamant that there needed to be a federal response. And the reason we were doing so poorly is because Trump refused to do that. And he wanted each state to take care of it. And so that's something he said, on, like, we need federal leadership. Right. He said those words. We need leadership. Yeah, exactly. He said and those during debates. And now he's like, well, now that it's to me, it's like... Actually, yeah, but are we surprised he's done that with everything? 
No, you know? and Dr. Fauci admitting yesterday that the administration has failed to distribute enough home COVID vaccine tests as Omicron cases spike 41% overnight and lines form at testing sites. But if this is the case, if there is no federal response, it, let's take that as true for one second. Let's pretend we believe that. Then you must close all state borders. If every state has to deal with it by itself, well, then, then by every state the, should be... The, the state should do that? Then each state should, then each each man for himself, if that's what it's got to be, right? So then again, this comes back to this idea of like civil war in the United States. Like, yeah. should we what just do they be consider the, 50 different countries? What do they consider the federal mandates then, though? Right, that's, that's the thing, response. right? Yeah. I mean, that was going to be my next point here, which is that, you know, so he says there's no federal, you know, this can't be handled at the federal level, and yet... The federal response to COVID is there because he's had, you know, federal vaccine mandates. And Build Back Better has money for federal response to COVID, which he still wants. Right. So if there's no so federal shall we response. So strip that out of Build Back Better then, Mr. President? <sighs> so I'm just throwing up my hands. I really, I can't wrap my head around it. I mean, and well, you and, see and other countries clear, that have handled you, it so much better. And you, you shake your head at the way that the United States has just bumbled this from the beginning. Yeah. From the beginning. And the thing is, like, from, from the very beginning as well, a lot of people are asking, like, they, they know now that these tests that they're using, they, they're not doing antigen tests. The tests that they're using are not accurate. And second, the, they, they are talking about, um, you know, only vaccines. They're not talking about any kind of prevention or anything. And there was another point that I had. Um, uh, shoot, I can't remember what it was now. That happens to me all the time. <laughs> Especially uh, when anytime oh, oh, I know, oh, I'm any, sorry, anytime I'm, I'm going to make three points, all I know the time. I'm lucky if yeah. I get the first two. Yes. <laughs> the, the other one was that the the don't know where these real time numbers come from. They can't verify wh how they're getting these real time. This is what how many cases there are. And especially if you're getting it out of false positives all the time. So those numbers right. have not been right from the beginning. And when he was vice president, the Obama administration actually spent taxpayer dollars on pandemic preparedness for there to be a federal response to pandemics. Right. So this was something he did believe in recent memory. Yeah, they had a plan. Like literally in the during Trump, during the Obama administration, we had this federal response to a pandemic. Like pra practice runs. You right. know, we wrote the manual. We just didn't follow the manual. Like utilizing FEMA, utilizing the CDC, all of these well, things. And, and, and then, often, okay, if there's no federal response, then we need no FDA because that is a federal agency, right? That makes right. medical. So is the CDC. Yeah, then we don't need right. the CDC either, right? So, yeah, what, what is the federal response? Maybe we're parsing words here, but it is, it's an infuriating thing to say because... It, uh, yeah, well, it's hypocritical and it's it's confounding both from a legal perspective and from an ethical perspective. I mean, if you're literally telling people that you you're going to lose your job, we're going to kick you out of the military. They lost a ton of Marines in the past week because of the federal vaccination mandate. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the same thing with healthcare workers. So now they're bringing in the National Guard. So, again, you're bringing in the National Guard to help at hospitals because healthcare workers were being forced to have vaccines. It makes no sense. Yeah. Right. And think about this. Think about like every president runs on getting rid of the, the policies of the previous president. Right. That's right. Like their major thing. And then they get in office and they just continue them anyway. It doesn't really matter what they are. Yeah. They end up continuing them. And the thing is, if Trump would have done these mandates, if Trump would have put the military and hospitals and done the same thing the Biden man admins doing, he would have gotten like raked across his coals, like kicked off of Twitter. Like he would have been facing a lot more than Biden is. You well, make a really good point about how the Biden administration is suing states over their COVID responses, right? And so if you're one of those lawyers, you're the defendant's lawyer based on like in Texas or, or Florida or Michigan, um, you're salivating over this because he has just said something publicly to the media that proves your case, right? right? Like, like can, can we roll this soundbite of the absolutely president? Absolutely, you can, because what Trump said to Lester Holt was used against him right. in many courts and, and legal proceedings. So this absolutely is fodder. Yeah. This is data. Meanwhile, is the president getting bad medical advice? Dr. Markey from Johns Hopkins University said that this whole vaccination versus unvaccination pitting population against population is the wrong way to handle this. 
And he thinks that President Biden is getting bad medical advice from his team. Let's listen to Dr. Markey on this question. Down, you know, this is in line with the idea that we need to make the life of the unvaccinated miserable. And that's a basically an edict that has come from the White House and from many advisors to the White House. I don't think the White House is getting good medical advice. This is hardening pe uh, people in their position. And the entire construct of the vaccinated and unvaccinated is a false construct. It should be more medically precise as the immune and the non-immune. Hallelujah, right? Immune and non-immune. New data this morning shows that too many shots also may be harming the body's ability to fight the virus. This according to scientists in Israel. That country is ready right now to roll out their new vaccination program for the fourth booster, the fourth shot in that, in that country. This country has been vaccination happy, getting ready for a fourth shot. But now we know that according to data in, from Israeli scientists, I'll put this up on the screen, the proposal to give a fourth dose to the most at risk drew criticism from other scientists and medical professionals who said it was premature and perhaps even counterproductive. Some experts have warned that too many shots eventually may lead to a sort of immune system fatigue, compromising the body's ability to fight the virus. I will say in this data, I was going through this data it's mostly the, the scientists in Israel are worried about the elderly specifically. So well, giving the elderly too many shots could compromise the, abil the ability and it could create immune uh, um, COVID virus fatigue or immunity well, and fatigue. I don't think a lot of people realize, too, that the, so when they manipulated the, the virus, they added the spike, right? The spike protein. So the spike protein is 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 synthetic. So in the in the the uh, vaccines, they recreated, they replicated this synthetic spike, and so when they give you the vaccine, you're actually getting a a jolt of this spike protein that's higher than you get from COVID, and it goes to all these this, these various places. So there's you're you're getting a synthetic thing that stays in your body that's an that is a foreign agent. So your body is not used to fighting synthetic things. So it go it goes crazy trying to figure out how to fight it, right? Because whether you get COVID or whether you get that, it's a synthetic spike. So right. this spike yeah. can stay in your system for 15 months each time you get that shot. So and imagine, yeah, and I guess that's what these scientists in Israel are saying is that it's, it's combining that. And so specifically elderly people, and yet that's the concern. So they are pushing these boosters there, these fourth shots for people over 60. So again, you have a government, on the one hand, you have the scientists in Israel saying, wait a second, that's a bad move. We should wait, wait, wait. And then you have the government in Israel saying, We're, we just approved this fourth shot, fourth shot now for people over 60. Mm -hmm. So, okay, you, are you listening to your scientists? They're telling you that this is going to, to cause an immune fatigue in your, in your body. But we, hey, we do have some positive news this morning out of South Africa. Because scientists at the Africa Health Research Institute looked at 15 vaccinated and unvaccinated people who'd been infected with Omicron. And when they tested their blood samples against the Delta variant, they found more than fourfold increase in antibodies against the virus over a two week period. And the data basically showed that people who were vaxxed had a slightly better response, but not much. So basically, people who get this mild Omicron are basically inoculated against the stronger Delta strains. So what are we panicking about? Again, I come back to that question. If Omicron is actually helping people, it's just a mild nose, runny nose. You know, it's a cough, a little scratchy throat, but it's actually protecting you against this more harmful variant. And what are we freaking out about? Yeah. No. I don't know. You know, it's like everything they say to new moms when your kid gets sick. It's like, oh, good. They need to get sick. It strengthens their immune system. We do believe that about children. Right. It's just our fear of COVID has sort of surpassed any reason yeah. at this point. We can't get a stimulus plan for Americans, but we can absolutely get a massive war budget to keep bombing other countries. President Biden authorized yesterday $768 billion in defense spending for 2022 on Monday. This budget passed with flying colors through Congress last month. There was nary a, nary a complainer in sight. Wait, where was the, where was the, uh, um, what do they call it? The, where they stand and... I can't even remember what that thing is called. The Bill of Filibuster. Where was the filibuster on this? Oh, one? there was no filibuster. No. Not no. on this. Phil, Phil and Buster were nowhere to be seen. They were oh. on vacation. 
They have nothing to they have nothing to complain about because this 2022 budget is five percent higher than last year. Includes 2.7 percent pay increase for troops, which is not very much when you consider people living in Social Security will get a 5.9 percent increase in 2022 due to inflation. And we should point out the new inflationary numbers this morning are about five percent. So, okay, it doesn't so that's they, no raise at all, really. That's no raise at all. And, and Biden asked Sorry. for a certain amount, and they just threw up more on top of it. They just 24 like threw, billion more. Yeah. He asked for specifically in the 750s, um, and Congress gave him 24 mil- billion more. Just there you go. Yeah, yeah, we can't get a stimulus. They can't figure this out. And, you know, Natalie brought up the point in the newsletter this morning, you know, like, why is the spending package so big, but the military personnel get so little so they can buy as many bombs as they want? But well, they said know, it, they said it's to prepare for China and Russia. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. China and Russia. We got to prepare. That's why we threw in this extra 24 billion in here. Um, and we've got a meeting scheduled with Russia on January 10th. The Biden administration had requested just $753 billion for the upcoming year. But Congress just went ahead and said, hey, we're going to sweeten the pot a little bit. We're going to throw this money on top of you, another $24 billion on top. No problem here. The U.S. has the largest military budget on the planet, more than triple that of China, the second largest military spender. So, you know, I always thought like- of our money. It's like Monsters, Inc. It's like we're, we've been trying fear for all this time. It's like we've never tried laughter. We've never once tried like, let's go put on <laughs> tank tops and shorts and let's go into some of these countries with food and let's actually help people and see like how how the, the opinion of the United States would change overnight if we actually helped people instead of killed them. We should have like the dude from uh, Big Lebowski, like have yeah. him roll in like, hey. Hey, it's the yeah. dude here. I'm, just I'm don't a, send Walter with him. I'm from America. I'm from <laughs> no. America. I'm here to help. <laughs> Instead, we up. got the nihilists. Yeah, <laughs> get nihil- send the nihilists, but don't send Walter with him because Walter will cause a war because his friends <laughs> didn't die face down in the muck for nothing. Hey, an update now on the Jill. <sighs> The Ghislaine, 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 Ghislaine Maxwell trial. Ghislaine. We're gonna, you know what? We're gonna call her G Max. G Max. From now on. <laughs> G Max, Epstein's right hand woman. Looks like the jury in the Gillene Maxwell trial G-Max. is not close to reaching a verdict. According to court watchers, the jury is nowhere near being ready for a verdict, and they are diving deeper into the word enticement. Do you guys know what enticement means? They asked for the judge to to define what this word meant to them and what exactly it means, because she would be charged with enticement. So that they better figure this out. I love that they literally have to ask the judge for their exact definition of this. Enticement actually means something used to attract or tempt someone, like a lure, like when you're enticing a fish. Kind of like the propaganda that that we get every day from the Mm -hmm. government. Yeah, that's an enticement. Enticement to believe or pay taxes. The jurors also asked for, get this, a multicolored sticky note pile and a whiteboard, along with transcripts of some trial testimony. Anytime you ask for a whiteboard and sticky notes, you know things are gonna take a while. Meanwhile, the judge in the trial has told the jury to prepare to stay late tonight until a verdict is reached. This budget does not the the um, sorry, the judge does not want this dragging on for another day. So he's telling them prepare to stay late tonight. This thing, if they're asking for a whiteboard and sticky notes, this thing is going to go on and on and on. Yeah. So there's a look at your news headlines. The I got just really quick, like how big were the sticky notes, the full size ones or the small size ones? Because I think <laughs> if they're small, it's going to take a lot longer. Definitely. Probably the probably the small ones. And, you know, the court, they have no money. They're like looking around. They're like, we don't even have sticky notes. Somebody <laughs> we don't even have a whiteboard. Someone's got to go down to Staples and buy this kind of stuff. This is what they're <laughs> dealing with right now. All right. We're going to get to more news here in a moment. We're going to tell you about what's happening with politicians and children under the covid lockdown. But I want to tell you about our first show sponsor our friends at Hone Health. Now, have you been feeling tired? Have you been feeling any kind of rundown? Um, Well, it may be hormonal, uh, not just the holidays getting to you. Um, It may be more than all of that. And, you know, if you have no energy to make it through the day, you're having a hard time putting on any muscle mass at all. Maybe your libido is not what it used to be. Well, your hormones could be to blame. And here's what Here's what's so interesting about Hone Health. Hone Health is an easy to use at home assessment test where you can learn your testosterone levels. And for a limited time only, listeners get the at home testing for a doctor and a doctor consultation for only $45. I'll tell you more how you can get that in a second. But did you know that testosterone levels have decreased substantially over generations? Our father's generation had testosterone levels that were 25% higher than ours today. 
And the thing is, it's not our fault. There's so many factors like environmental changes. Um, there are 30 million men in the United States that have low testosterone that's affecting their daily lives. And Hone Health can help you figure this out. Testosterone is more than just a sex hormone. It affects energy levels, muscle mass, focus, overall mood. And Hone Help, Hone helps men get testing and treatment for low testosterone from the comfort of your own home. They have an easy process. They collect a sample. You mail it into the lab. Once the results are ready, you'll video chat with a real doctor. The doctor will recommend a personalized treatment plan based on your biomarkers and your symptoms. Treatment includes FDA-approved medication delivered straight to your door. I'm not a medical expert. I'm not a medical expert at all. Hone Health is, and they will be there with you every step of the way. So how to get this right now for only $45, go to HoneHealth.com slash invest to take advantage now. That's Hone, H-O-N-E, health.com slash invest to get the at-home testing and doctor consultation for only $45. You see it right there on your screen. Go to HoneHealth.com slash invest to take advantage now and to learn about your testosterone levels um, and take advantage of this great discount. So our thanks to them for supporting the show. Well, a new Gallup poll is out and shows approval ratings of the most popular and talked about politicians and public figures and public servants uh, in, I guess, in the United States. It's a strange list because it only really mentions the people that you might know, right? So we're not talking about Secretary of Defense or anything like that. Well, okay, who has the highest numbers? Uh, U.S. Supreme Court Justice John Roberts is at the top of the list with a 60% approval rating. At the bottom are the two leaders of Congress, Speaker Nancy Pelosi and <laughs> Senate Republican Leader Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell has a 34% approval rating. And I'm surprised 60 it's that high. Yeah. Who, yeah. who are those people? Um, really like Nancy Mitch. Pelosi has a 40 percent approval rating. What? These are all donors who have contributed to this and poll. And only slightly above those numbers is President Joe Biden at 43 uh, percent. So those are pretty oh, low man. numbers. Yeah. Sorry. sorry. Um, but topping the list, the top three are, uh, like I mentioned, Justice John Roberts, Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell, that one has me scratching my head. Mm. Mm. I think, I don't know, maybe they're asking people who just kind of know the names and general media bent about them, right? Yeah. Like, are those are these people actually studying the jobs? And then number three is Dr. Anthony Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. Wow. So people so, like him. Dr. Fauci. Because they did such a big PR campaign for him, like back in the day, you know. Well, I mean, they it was even like, got a documentary out of him, you know, on Disney. Like, yeah, he's got like, a, a children's book, yeah. and uh, yeah. So people seem to. I mean, forty-seven percent. I mean, it's it's, but that that's not necessarily a high approval rating. That's right along the middle. Wait, what is the number? Fifty-two percent approve, forty-seven percent disapprove. Fifty-two. That's still half the country in this poll say that Dr. Fauci is okay. But if you God, think about the, the the amount of people who are thinking critically in this moment, that's pretty low, right? So people are only answering based on their own conviction bias. So what right, media do they also, consume? What headlines do they see? Exactly. Who's on their social media? They're not actually thinking like, oh, let me read a book or do some research about you know this in a contextual way. Contextual yeah, thinking is... If they watch the mainstream media, then Fauci is still highly regarded and held as like a hero. He They're gets a lot of airtime, too, though. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that's I mean, he's on TV every day. I mean, literally, this was propagandist. This was yesterday. I mean, he was on CNN yesterday on Sunday. He was on the Sunday shows. I mean, he was on CNN yesterday talking about cases and spewing some craziness, by the way. I mean, like this is like what he said yesterday in the face of this new data. Like, like, let's listen to what he said. This is exactly why I'm scratching my head about this. The other thing that's going on there, as you probably know, is that it looks like the, the degree of severity of the disease is considerably less than they experienced with Delta. We're seeing inklings of that now in the United States, the UK. Okay, so you heard him, right? Omicron, very, you know, hey, very, very mild, not a big deal, not a big deal. And then he, in the same breath. Is also seeing that. So I do hope that we do have the net effect is a diminution 
in the degree of severity, but the sheer volume of cases okay. that we're seeing now, yesterday we had 214,000 cases. Even with a diminution in severity, we still could have a surge on hospitals, particularly among the unvaccinated, which they... Again, <laughs> flying in the face of your own data, your own research, the, what the administration has been saying, what, what we're seeing from scientists across the board, what we just did in our whole top segment here this morning, Again, you say one thing and then you're saying the exact opposite that, in the same breath. That was well, the point. Well, you that, say that one thing and use it in order to like come to a, a, a different conclusion that serves the government. Right. 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 Well, and there were there were other scientists that have that, that they had on the board to to talk to Fauci, Fauci and the administration, and these people showed up with data, showed up with facts and all this other stuff, but they never wanted to hear it, and finally got rid of those people that actually were coming in with with information. So, what data are they even looking at? If they didn't want to see these people's data of of actual numbers, they're just they're just you know inflating everything. Conflating. Well, I think we shouldn't. I'm a scientist. Yeah, don't question me. I don't think we should put too much stock into this Gallup poll because most of them are split down the board. The only really polarized people here who either have extremely good or extremely bad are the two leaders of Congress and Supreme Court Justice John Roberts. That one, I'm, I'm not sure why people like him so much, why he's well, got Well, I always a, question these polls anyway, because it's like, we don't see the questions. We don't see the demographic. We don't like see who they actually polled. Like we, we don't know. Are they still calling people with phones? You know what I mean? No, the, the they, only, they do give a methodology. They always do in a Gallup poll and they'll tell you, you know, um, so I, I don't think, I think because they're all so split down the middle, we can co kind of surmise that this is just a, a, this is not a result of deep thought. It's just someone calls you, you give them a ranking. Do we have Manchin? That's what was just, his his approval? Was Manchin's the, not on here, but House Leader Kevin asking. McCarthy is. Kamala Harris has 44%, um, which is higher than the president by only one point. Mm. Attorney General Merrick Garland at 49%, same as Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. Anthony Blinken, excuse me. It's because no one knows who he is. Anthony. The Secretary of State? Yeah. We will once we start to use all that military money. <laughs> I, well, I guess when we have our meetings with Russia, then maybe we'll actually have some Anthony Blinken headlines to talk about. Mm. People know who he is. Most people don't even know who the vice president of the United States is. So, yeah, I don't know. Look, we all had an idea that this was going to be bad going under lockdown, how this was going to affect our children. Um, these restrictions. We've reported here on the show for uh, for many, many months um, how difficult this was, especially for underprivileged children who didn't have any access to internet. Um, 12 million Americans, 12 million children who just didn't have any access to internet. They had to get in their cars. They had to drive to a parking lot of a school district, sit in the car and use, and they would put Wi-Fi hotspots inside of a bus and they would sit in the car while the parents just like ran the, uh, you know, ran the engine to keep them heated in the car. Uh, and they would sit there and use the Wi-Fi hotspot from the bus in the parking lot of the school. Like that, that's got to be great for learning. Well, we have a new report out this morning that the nation's recent lockdown policies and mask mandates created a generation of children who exhibit lower IQs and signs of social brain damage, according to a clinical psychiatrist for children and adolescents and this new study out of Brown University. So the, the study was actually sponsored by the National Institute of Health and showed that children, very young children born during the pandemic who were either in utero during the early stages of the pandemic or are in preschool at this moment, uh, do show levels of cognitive decline, lower vocabulary skills and lower um, cognitive functioning due to, I mean, so many factors. We could just start listing them right now and that would take up the whole rest of the show. It does though show that, uh, boys are more predisposed to this amount of stress and the cognitive decline. Um, and we, you know, expect to see though that as a result of test test results or test scores and um, academic performance in this generation to come. But it does show that having money buffers you from this experience. Because, Shocking. Uh, you know, people of lower socioeconomic status experience these negative impacts more. Why? Because 
Uh, they don't have help in the home because they can't pay for any extra resources, extra tutoring. They d maybe didn't have the access to broadband and private schools. Um, and so, again, it matters when you think about, oh, but there's no federal response to COVID. There really was no federal response to learning either. There was no standardization of what was going to happen to all of these students and all of these children, even though daycare centers opened up long before schools. Um, it matters. In fact, there was a friend of mine was telling me this story, or was it you that told me this story? You are my friend, but I'm not, a, I'm not just a friend. Um, I'm a husband. <laughs> and they say he's just a friend, uh, about a child who was in New York city, who someone, one of my friends said, like someone came up to help him hand him his ball or something. And the kid freaked out because they're not used to other adults. And any childhood development book will tell you what do children need when they are immature and their brains are development is human touch, human interaction. And specifically, this is something I've been really worried about is eye contact mm -hmm. um, and facial expressions because children who can't speak read nonverbal cues. Um, in fact, humans are one of the only primates that have the whites of their eyes showing. And so we direct children, look there, look at mommy, go, go to that ball, right? With our eyes and our facial expression and in a world of masks and lockdowns and not interacting with other people, not having multiple adults, um, it, it affects these children and it, it breaks my heart. It really does. It. If you look at the studies, I mean, um, in these doctors that say uh, Carl Hennig, who's director of Oxford University Center for Evidence-Based Medicine, said that uh, that eight out of 10 children in their study in adolescence report a worsening of behavior or psychological symptoms or an increase in negative feelings due to COVID-19 pandemic. School closures, he says, contributed to increased anxiety, loneliness, stress, negative feelings um, due to COVID-19 increase with the duration of the school closure. So the longer they were home, the worse off these kids were specifically deteriorating mental health was found to be worse in females, which I found interesting and older adolescents. What do you think accounts for that on the female side? Uh, repeat the statistics that, that Men it, deteriorating mental health was found to be worse in females, female child mm -hmm. children. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure, but it, I, I found it interesting that they did not find uh, any change in perceived stress of the mother, which just shows you that mothers are right, <laughs> like we can handle it. Um, and so even though it was more stressful for us, we just kept we just kept handling it. We know you guys are strong. Mike drop is what I'm going to say to that. Yeah, you guys are strong. <laughs> we, um, we take it for the team, you guys. But well, what more gets me too really is that like there was so much data in Sweden showing like they did not do that. They didn't pull kids out of school. They left them open. They 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 saw no you know risks. They saw you know things didn't increase with teachers getting COVID or whatever. So it's like they had so much data they could have gone off of to not do this to kids because this is such a critical part of their lives. Well, it does. There are data. There is data that shows that at lost time in school results in a lower lifespan. So that specifically that data has been done around high school dropouts. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you drop out of school and you're not exposed to a certain amount of structure in your childhood, that does correlate to a lower life expectancy. So what have we done collectively to an entire generation by just taking a year out of their education, right? And so it becomes this philosophical trade-off of, do we protect elderly people from COVID and prolong their lives, or do we take the lives off of the upcoming generation? Hmm. That's a tough question. Say in our, uh, in our chat says, uh, says, what What hasn't the government done? What do you know that they don't know that you can suggest to make the situation better? Well, specifically like what Natalie just talked about. I mean, going into a broad lockdown, go, removing children from an, ex, I mean, removing children from an educational experience lowers their lifespan. Like, yeah. That data is, has existed. Now, right? our, our children that. are in an American school in a European country that receives money from the U.S. State Department. In order to be an accredited U.S. school abroad, our children's school had to prove that they could go virtual in the event of an emergency or else they wouldn't be an accredited American school abroad, right? So they've had an emergency preparedness plan in place for 12 years. 
So when the pandemic hit, our school was like, oh, we've been ready. The American government made us be ready. So the American government has prepared foreign schools better than it prepared its own schools on home territory. Why is that? So don't tell me that that <laughs> Clayton's pushing me into shot. Uh, don't don't tell me the American government couldn't have been prepared for this. They absolutely could. They required this of other organizations. Right. And they had a great response to and, it. And our, our children never missed one day of school. They did and, go and, virtual and, right away. And to talk about, I mean, let's just talk, I'm not talking about the Biden administration or the Trump administration. I'm talking about the American government. I mean, we don't have internet access for 12 million Americans. Um, we are the best country in the world, and yet we have uh, internet access that ranks below Estonia. Uh, you know, for, for internet speeds and infrastructure. I'm um, just go to travel to Europe, travel to other parts of the world where they have like a high speed fiber networks and the United States doesn't. So we knew that our infrastructure was crumbling and to have an education system, even President Trump just the other day in an interview was saying, you know, American education system is awful. <laughs> He's yeah. the one, he, he specifically saying that yet like two, uh, like a week ago in an interview. So we've known that America's education system is a, is a sham. We've known that our, in, our institutions and infrastructure have been a, a sham. And yet we spend $768 billion a year to bomb other countries. But like, I think these international schools are a good example of the fact that the government can do it. The government has standards. Fed, they have educational standards and emergency plans for American schools abroad, but why not do that on right. our own soil? So embassy children can get a great, you know, access to education in other parts of the world, but they can in the United States. It's amazing you have to go abroad to get good American school education. You don't get it at home. <laughs> That's sad. Yeah. Really, really sad. So again, and I just want to wrap this this point up, this story up with, you know, kids under COVID and being under lockdown. As of December 27th, yesterday, the Biden administration is recommending that children too young to be vaccinated should be surrounded by vaccinated people and mask in public indoor spaces, including schools, according to COVID plan on the White House website that I've researched this morning. For those adolescents age 12 and above who are eligible for vaccination, the most important step parents can take is to get them vaccinated, according to the White House website. As of December 27th, the website says that over half of the nation's adolescents have been vaccinated. So again, masking, you know, if you're not vaccinated, then they're you're gonna you know keep you separated. And have this you ever is seen those, absolutely hurting children? Have you ever seen those horrible videos of of parents trying to hold masks on a plane on their two year old kids? Oh, it's uh, awful. It's it's horrendous. Yeah, yeah, they're crying and like yeah, come on. And we know the effects of this on children is negligible at best. I mean, when our three year old wore masks when the pandemic, she's five now, but when it first began, she would just chew on it. And then it was a whole soaked piece of saliva cloth. And I was like, that's not helping anybody. What you're doing right now, you're doing it wrong. So there are plenty of times because children in um, where we live, seven and under, don't have to wear them. And I'm like, I'm not going to make you, you know, why do that? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It's, it's crazy. And, and I think it's, it will be interesting to keep an eye on this generation um, because we owe them. We owe them big time, you know. Yeah. We have to make up for it in their lives at some point, and I don't know exactly how. No, I don't know when it's going to happen. Tube. But first, you want to tell us about our friends over at Morris Invest? Or how about I do that? You want me to tell? I'll tell sure. them. Sure. So Morris Invest, if you're interested in learning about real estate investing uh, and getting started putting your money to work for you as a performing asset, Head on over to our, we've got a special webinar that we're putting together where you can learn about real estate investing. It's about an hour of your time. We have a few spots left right now. I think we have about 62 spots left. Um, if you go to uh, morrisinvest.com slash webinar, you can learn all about investing in real estate, what it means for your financial future, how much money you need for down payments, taxes, what, it, what the benefits are for creating positive cash flow and performing assets. If you know nothing about it, this is a great educational experience for you. It's totally free. So go check it out. Again, we're putting on this special webinar. I believe we have over a little over 60 spots left. Oh, no, now we're down 59. So people are already signing up. Um, but if you want to go over to, here's the landing page. Again, right there on your screen, morrisinvest.com slash webinar. Click on the claim your spot button. 
And then we're going to jump online and, and I'm going to take you through all of the process of, inv of investing in real estate and what it looks like from the ground up, understanding the best markets in the country and all of those things. So go check it out. Go to morrisinvest.com slash webinars right there on your screen and claim your spot today. Oh, we got 57, 57. So a bunch of you already signing up. So that's good. That's we good. appreciate it very much. We appreciate it. All right. Americans are ditching their TV news in droves. The same trend applies to print media and print media subscriptions, digital news subscriptions. The numbers are shocking, uh, but you have to just oppose this with the fact that in 2020, when we had, oh, let's see, a major pandemic, we had the Trump Biden presidential election and all of the polarization that went along with that. We had an impeachment. Maybe we forgot. Uh, and the, the start of the, did I say the start January of January 6th riots? Well, that was in 2021, but Thank still you. we can lump oh, it yeah. in with that. That era. Yes, the yeah. era. So those things made news media ratings shoot through the roof. And since then, Americans have felt like I need to turn it off, right? So look at some of these numbers. In 2021, primetime viewership dropped 38% at CNN, 34% at Fox News, and 25% at MSNBC. These, are, these numbers according to Nielsen, the rating company. Uh, the decline was steep, but still significant at broadcast TV. These are the ones that you don't need a cable subscription for. So specifically, ABC lost 12% viewers, 14% uh, at, I'm sorry, 12% at ABC and CBS, and 14% for NBC's nightly news. Uh, same trend, again, for New York Times subscriptions, Washington Post subscriptions. Media analysts are saying, you know, this was to be expected. People were so wound up during this crazy news era of 2020 that they just felt like they needed to let it go. Um, it, was in, it was predictable. And they think that in some ways, the media made themselves what this one uh, journalism professor at the University of Maryland says, a prisoner of the audience that they built because they can rile someone up according to one level of conviction bias, right? And then they have to stick with it. They cannot mea culpa. And then those stories phase out and they need more stories in that same vein, right? So it's interesting to see um, it does not necessarily account for distrust in the media. It just sort of, the way this story is framed is people are just tired of it. They just got tired of it, right? Not that they stopped trusting it, which is interesting. I, I, I don't know would be that. more interested to see whether or not people just felt like I'm not, I'm not getting the real story anymore and I'm going to self curate my news. Well, let's be, uh, let's be honest too, that this story is published uh, by the Associated Press. So for the Associated Press to come out and be like, people just don't trust the media anymore. I mean, you are the media <laughs> Associated Press. And by the way, right. your news gets handed to all of these major news outlets and they regurgitate what you print. So for them to come out with a big story that says people don't trust the media, but I think that is, let me ask you guys in the chat. I mean, do you trust the mainstream media? I mean, the whole reason we do this show is to bring you the stories and, and facts that you're not going to see in the mainstream media because we don't have a billionaire telling us what to say. We don't have a billionaire agenda telling us what to do. We don't have a Rupert Murdoch. We don't have a Jeff Zucker. We don't have these big Time Warner media companies telling us what to do and what to publish and what stories not cover and what not to publish. But we also have to suffer the same existential crisis of the fact that People were more prone to come to a show like this when they felt like they were constantly at threat of the Trump administration or COVID or what what have you, the January 6th insurrection. And it has sort of settled down. And it so we have to juxtapose our need to our need, our desire to have a large audience and a large engaged and meaningful audience. Right. Not just bots, not just numbers. Um, and also realize that we cannot just. We, we, what's the saying? Catch flies with honey. We, we can't you catch more flies with honey than you can vinegar. Right. We can't just rile people up in the same way that the media does for our own self-serving, you know, um, interest. We have to think about the fact that, okay, right now there may not be this massive appetite for news. Can we provide value in a different way? Can we help people think contextually? Um, and what we would like specifically, what we talk about is, 
how do we not make these mistakes, right? Having well, both come from the media, we both worked in, in for these networks that are listed right here. Well, Sai in the <laughs> chat, say in the chat. <laughs> You're cracking me up. Is basically saying that we've become Fox News on this channel. So, Have we? Mm, that's, what, okay. that's what they're saying. Yeah. Where okay. does that say that? What does that mean? It's, I don't know. Like it, it was way up, but they, they're saying that uh, uh, basically, um, like one of the points, let me see here, going up. I'd be curious uh, what he means all, by that or she means with, by that. With all the pressure on Manchin and progressive issues, did he budge? If Biden then looks for a conservative to get half the price of the bill passed, Clayton and company would complain some more. Uh, and yeah, up, up top, they said we were like Fox News now. Mm. Like, mm. Well, well, here's the thing. I've been, no, because Fox News would absolutely support a $768 billion defense budget. Um, and think about all of the generals that are on their air on a regular basis, promoting the idea of not leaving Afghanistan, staying in these war zones on a regular basis. We here on this channel, me specifically, am completely anti-war and think that that $768 billion defense budget should be uh, not spent on war, should be invested in the United States, lowering taxes, all of those things to make sure that our infrastructure is taken care of. And you know, there's a difference between socialism and social uh, and, and social democracy. And what I support is social democracy. You're not going to hear that on Fox News. The word social anything is going to be vilified. And I've been on this show talking about the need to take care of our people, to make sure that our people are taken care of, health care, education, free university. That's not something you're going to hear on Fox News. If you do, you'll be laughed off the air. Like I mean, oh. look, we follow the mainstream media to see what are the themes that they are trying to promote. And then we try to collectively think about it a little bit more um, slowly, I suppose. <laughs> That's what we're working towards, right? So when we sit down and say, oh, should we cover this story that we're going to do next about UFOs or what have you? We'll say, like, what are the mainstream media saying there? Is there anything that we're missing? Is there anything we can provide value by discussing it with you in our chat room? Right. Um, and to be fair, sometimes the mainstream media does get it right. There are times when they do absolutely, dive absolutely. in and do a good job, and we should give them credit for that and to encourage them to do that. Because if we encourage those things, then maybe they'll be like, oh, when we tell the truth, we actually get more viewers. Right. And so there's going to be stories that I'll agree with Fox, their take on it based on their interviews and, 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 and facts that they've managed to uncover. Uh, for instance, I will praise Tucker Carlson in covering the UFO story. No one else will cover it. And I, I arguably think it's the biggest story of all time. <laughs> and he's, there's only one news organization that's really even covering it. And when Tucker has Luis Elizondo on or he has uh, Nick Pope from the former Br British Defense Ministry talking about these government programs that are covering up and they're hiding this information, why is he the only one covering this story? So I will praise certain things and then I will chastise them for other things. That's, you know. They're, they're on the air for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So they're going to get some things right. They're going to get some things wrong, just like we do here. So, anyway. yeah, I didn't mean for this to be a navel gazing <laughs> segment about us, but I do <laughs> think media? that, yes, if we're going to cover a story like this, we cannot pretend that we're any better than them with our same needs to and desires to have an engaged and meaningful audience, well, right? One little one little button up I do want to say on this is that Kyle Kalinske covered this yesterday. We've been covering it here on this show, which is the the tech oligarchy and the mainstream media going to great lengths to squash independent media. And so we are independent media. You know, our channel, mm -hmm. what we do here on this show is independent media and we're independent journalists and we cover these stories from an independent point of view. We're not bought and sold by billionaires. And YouTube and other major tech oligarchies are going to great lengths to squash independent media, independent voices who would challenge YouTube, who would challenge Twitter, who would challenge Facebook. And they are suppressing content. They are keeping voices quiet. Uh, and when you suppress anybody's, I mean, conservative, progressive, it doesn't matter. That's not freedom. I mean, that is not free. You know, you are you are suppressing voices and you are, I, in my opinion, hurting democracy, hurting yeah. this country. Agreed. And that's what's and happening right now. And some of the things like there's very important topics that we need to talk about. And, and it's like there are topics that if we talked about on this channel, we would be banned, suspended and all that other stuff. But yet the mainstream media can cover it in a, in a biased way to their agenda and they get promoted. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So there you go.